Thank you all for being here. I'm Walter Isaacson, and this started in a uh, unusual way. Uh, I was asked to talk, probably at a very small session at South By, on my new book, The Innovators, and they said, why don't you get somebody to uh, interview you or moderate? And so I asked Megan Smith, and I asked Eric Schmidt, and they both said yes, and then everybody realized that they're a lot more interesting than I am. Nobody Walter, wants to hear no, me. The first thing so you said is not true. Yeah. So we're going to do this where instead of everybody interviewing me, I'm going to ask some questions of Eric and of Megan. And then I'm going to let Megan maybe ask a few. And then Eric is going to both moderate some questions from Twitter, maybe throw in one or two of his own, and maybe even call an audible and go to the audience. Now, if you don't have that straight, don't worry. We'll see how it works. We have with us Megan Smith, the U.S. Chief Technology Officer, Assistant to President Obama, somebody transforming the use of technology in our government, and an icon of bringing people into government who are innovative. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Used to be a Vice President at Google. Speaking of which, Eric Schmidt, of course, you all know, is the Executive Chairman of Google, used to be the CEO of Google, I've watched them over the years. Uh, I was away from Sun Microsystems. Uh, we're old enough to remember them. And, uh, but also is on the President's um, uh, Committee on Science and Technology. I have at least uh, four of those words right, PCAT. Anyway, welcome both of them. Thank you all for having me. And I'm gonna start with Eric. One of the things when you write about innovation is that it happens at places like South By, but big companies can't do it. You watch Xerox not being able to pull off, you watch Bell Labs, you watch RCA. How does Google break that? Well, you know, it, there were always com big companies that were innovators. Uh, think about Sony in the 1980s. And think about the iPod, which they didn't a, innovate. A, and a powerful, uh, with a powerful founder CEO at the time who transformed Japan for many years. Think about 3M and their culture for many years, a great product company, or even Procter & Gamble. So we had models, but in tech, something would happen that the companies would be very effective when they were sort of this scale, and then they would ossify at some larger scale for some reason. And a lot of people now believe that we're in a different phase. We have a different kind of leadership that understands how to do this. And I think not just Google, but other large companies are proving that they can innovate at scale. At Google, what happened, of course, is that it's founder-driven with Larry and Sergey, and they had the idea of doing interesting new things through a mechanism called Google X. And the idea with Google X is you take overlapping Venn diagrams of really challenging, really hard, but still possible, and you find a leader. Right? In our case, for example, we put together a life sciences team of a, a doctor who needed both technical groups as well as uh, medical groups to build a contact lens, which we re released, which has the world's smallest battery, and will tell you, if you what your bl blood glucose level is. You know, one of the things that Steve Jobs said to Larry Page uh, when Steve was still with us was that uh, Google has got a focus. You're trying to do far too many things. You're going to end up like Microsoft, which for him was not a compliment. Um, and, he, and he said, you know, you've got to you know, keep it to five or six things, not a hundred. Is that right, or is letting well, a thousand well, flowers bloom well, in, a good in idea? In America, the two top tech companies are Apple and Google in that order. So it looks like both strategy have worked, mm -hmm. right? Good Apple point. building beautiful integrated products, and Google trying to do new and innovative things in a different space. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact of the matter is, I think both can be true. You, the Google model, which is organized around innovation at scale, has no signs of limits at the moment. There's so many problems that technologically can be solved now that could not be solved until now. Um, one, the, I met a group of filmmakers here who's doing something about the future of artificial intelligence. Is it gonna be utopian or dystopian? Y'all at Google are probably the furthest along at machine learning and trying to push towards artificial intelligence. Tell us what you're doing and tell us whether we should be worried, as Elon Musk is and others, about some singularity hitting us. 
Um, I'm, I'm certainly not worried in the next 10 or 20 years about that. We're still in the baby steps of understanding things. We've made tremendous pro uh, progress with respect to AI. I'll give you an example, Google Translate. There's a cute story this past weekend of a, 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 an attractive man who's French in Haiti and an attractive woman who's English also in Haiti who fell in love over Google Translate. That's AI making somebody's life special, yeah. right? Because AI is used to do the translation. When you use any form of Google voice recognition, you're using Google artificial intelligence. That's where we are. So it's a bet as to how far that will go, but most people think we'll be able to get to good question and answering systems in the next five years and maybe get some advice, like how many days should I stay at South by Southwest? And do I really want to go to that concert or would I really want to go to that dinner? Uh, I think that the stuff beyond that is at this point really speculation. I'm, a, I'm not a dystopian, I'm a utopian if you phrase it that way. I think that this technology will ultimately be one of the greatest forces for good in mankind's history simply because it makes people smarter. One of the themes that when I was writing about the digital revolution was that there were two views. One was that we should pursue, as Alan Turing and others thought, artificial intelligence, machines that'll think without it. The other begins with Ada Lovelace, who I know Megan's a fan of, but all the way through Engelbart and uh, Licklider and Steve Jobs, which is symbiosis, this notion that humans working with machines will always do more than machines alone. It's pretty clear that jobs will be plentiful and that the jobs will be those, the best jobs will be the ones that work with computers. And the reason is that there's a set of things that, that computers can do that are very difficult for humans, like infinite memory. And there's a set of things that humans do that are going to be very difficult co for computers, which have to do with judgment. You combine the two, you get a very powerful concept, a very powerful execution engine in almost any field. Megan Smith, what is the hardest thing about getting government to innovate, what's the biggest difference from going to Google to the White House, and how do you fix the problems? Yeah, you know, um, a couple things. A lot of people ask me about culture, and what I've discovered in Washington is very entrepreneurial people. Um, the technical people have been missing. Not technical people like, of course, our NASA teams and, and NIH and others, amazing teams, but really the digital, the digital government people. And so, the team CTO, uh, our team is part of uh, architecting or putting together that uh, strategy, and it's really starting to come together. Um, Todd Park, who's here, uh, worked really closely with the president Todd of the team. Todd came with you? Yeah, he, he happens to be here. We're, we're here recruiting. Todd, for, where are please you? Join. Is he in the Stand room? up and he wave be, if but, you're uh, here. He's not here. There's okay. Vivian from U.S. Digital Service. So the United States Digital Service was started with uh, leadership from Jen Palka, who was a, a deputy CTO at the time. So how do we get, basically the idea of this is, how do you get in this country where we make Google, we make Amazon, we make uh, Facebook, these kinds of amazing products and consumer services, why aren't those people in government? And what we're seeing is they're beginning to come. Uh, we have the number three employee of Amazon. You know, every box you get is related to, you know, the smile is a so software that she built at Amazon. What's your second act after you build Amazon? Mm -hmm. The American veterans. And what you know, so we're seeing this talent, and it really hits the theme that Eric's talking about, people do things. Things don't just magically happen, and government has been missing, I call it TQ, like IQ or EQ, our TQ teammates. So the economists and the legislators and all the folks that are there are terrific. It's well, just there. You've uh, actually recruited a lot of people out of tech who were successful in tech, including yourself, who wanted to serve the country. That's right. right. And so the idea is there's digital service. And so we can come you know, for a period of years. There's people who come for two weeks. There's people who just are doing open source code and helping. So it's a range of, range of service. But it's almost like um, the government has, you know, we have this great car, and we're all in it, and some of the tires are flat. Right. It's not that we need tons of technical people, but we need some. And I think the experience of healthcare.gov uh, really taught the president and his team that he was missing a set of Americans uh, from the core of the different agencies, and he went out to get us. So you see the 18F team, which is an embedded uh, developer designer team in GSA, the, the, um, together with sort of the folks who, who run USA.gov and data.gov. There's a lot of that focus. Our team's also working a lot on tech policy, so net neutrality, um, 
spectrum, uh, patent reform, all the topics, and having technical people at the table in addition to those advising from the outside. What are you doing that's most exciting that helps make uh, it more inclusive? Yeah, so uh, inclusive in a lot of ways. So inclusive sometimes means diversity, which we should talk about. I'm going to first talk about inclusive as in there's a whole lot of Americans who aren't at South by Southwest right now. If you think about our country, there's the kind of, I think if you think about the innovators who are part of this high paying, interesting, high passion, high impact jobs. And then there's a bunch of people who are stuck. We were talking about some of the companies that are kind of rust belt or stuck in those areas. How do we get those Americans up and how do we get the Americans who are facing some of the situations in Ferguson and other places you know, into the innovation economy? We launched something last week called Tech Hire. There's five million jobs open in the United States right now. Uh, half a million of them are in tech, and a lot of them are entry level. And not everyone can go get a four-year degree. Um, they might have challenges in different ways, and people have invented coding boot camps. And so uh, we're seeing things in St. Louis and Louisville, and a bunch of cities have emerged where employers are, in addition to the classic hiring they're doing, they're starting to pick up people off code boot camps. They're doing apprentices, all kinds of ad adaptation. How worried are you so that we're going to have a digital in. divide? I think doing initiatives like this are going to help a lot. The president also, we launched uh, Connect Ed. How are we going to get Wi-Fi and connectivity in the classroom so we can adapt that? How are we going to get it at home for the lower income students? Um, what are we doing around just broadband? Uh, the president was in Cedar Falls talking about Chattanooga, other high-speed broadband initiatives that we need to take. So 25% of Americans are not online. We have a project, I see Ryan, uh, who's deputy CTO, was a presidential innovation fellow. Uh, we call it Connectivity Deserts, the places in the US and outside the US where the internet is missing. You know, it's very important if you want to be part of the innovation economy to be online. So we're doing work on Native American lands uh, with Department of Interior, with the FCC. Um, we're doing work overseas around uh, West Africa, of course, through Ebola. Um, but how, it, same issue as you brought up, people. The people in this room who understand backhaul, the people in our country who understand backhaul, and that we need those TQ, those, those engineers to come advise in government to help us move faster. And then the next Presidential Innovation Fellows team, we're going to have some of those that we're calling for. So that they can be in the room when we're making policy decisions and project execution decisions doesn't mean government's going to start building everything ourselves. In fact, I think we're going to move from RFPs to APIs and marketplaces uh, with the talent we have. And most things will come from the outside as they do. We're just kind of upgrading that contractor group. But also having a few people at the table who understand that language as we architect is really critical. And uh, we hope people will consider it part of their tech career that you will serve government at some point, um, even well, if you Well, maybe we could days. have a one year like we did with Teach for America, yeah. a, a specific set of years, in one or two years, in which you decide you're going to serve America in the tech industry. We hope people do that, and we're seeing people already. We have had people from Twitter and Facebook and uh, from, from uh, Google, other places who've come for two weeks, three months, short periods, as well as longer. Can service. they send you your re their resumes? They can. They actually, uh, on the US Digital Service site, U.S. Digital Service. Yeah. Go to the site, yeah. sign up, help the... All right, I'm going to ask one question to both of you and then turn it over to Megan, which is what could government do to make it so that the people in this room could be more entrepreneurial? Well, actually, it's, it's, it's worth saying that innovation and entrepreneurship is the solution to almost every problem along with broadband. Sorry. Mm -hmm. And, I agree with you. And the reason is that if you talk to most politicians, and I've had the privilege of talking to most of them now, <laughs> uh, more jobs would solve most of their problems in most countries. And the easiest way to solve the jobs problem is to create more entrepreneurs, you know, mine entrepreneurs and bitcoins. And if we create entrepreneurs at every level and in every industry, I'm not just talking about tech, um, they tend to, they overweight job creation. People have studied this. And the net new jobs created in the last 20 years, 70% of the net new jobs have been from small, fast-growing companies, the so-called gazelles. Right? So everything you can do. So what are the things? Education. And education doesn't mean more money in education. It means education that's around becoming an entrepreneur. What are the things you need to know in order to become an entrepreneur? And encouraging the creation of it. Right? Other things. Immigration. Immigrants are more likely to become entrepreneurs and more likely to create jobs. We have the world's stupidest policy in this country, which is that we basically give people degrees and kick them out, right? another, another brilliant US policy, um, and on and on and on. So immigration, internet, 
entrepreneurship and fixing the educational system. All of those require government action. Education is largely government controlled. Immigration is clearly government controlled. Broadband, there are still significant barriers to broadband adoption. We need broadband access everywhere and we need competitive broadband in every city. Wait, so how do we get competitive broadband along with Google Fiber being one answer? But where, where I tend to be, it's almost a monopoly. You have well, to go to your cable company. So, so in, a, in a simple way, as a citizen of America, the, the whole adoption of the US is choice and competition. Correct. So whenever you come across a place where you don't have a choice, try to figure out what is the market or regulatory failure. In many cases, the problem is that the, the fiber, for example, will run down the street, but there's no way to get the fiber from the street to your apartment building because the way the co-op works or the condo works or so forth and so on. So figuring out the local laws, uh, the local pole attachment laws, which is now largely uh, addressed with the Title II reclass and other things, is a huge difference. There are plenty of ways of making money offering broadband. Google is an example, but we want as much competition as possible. Yeah, and one of the things that just the meta point here, two things. I love the entrepreneurship point because really if you look at history, entrepreneurs, whether they're social entrepreneurs, political, capitalists, um, are the people who start and solve problems. So the more we can do to support them and make sure we have kind of the plumbing layer uh, below that, whether that's funding or whether that's broadband. Um, I think that uh, in, in terms of broadband, I think you're right, sort of debugging at the local level is critical. And w one of the things we're doing is we've noticed, I noticed, you know, I've been in government only since September, but I, I've been able to interact with a lot of interesting local officials. And I find that a lot of the mayors have a solution to youth staying in school, a solution to local broadband, a solution to, the mayor of South Bend has this incredible program where he's instrumented the, the utilities and he's able to load balance his sewer system and not have to build the second sewer system for $600 million. So, you know, he has that as a smarter, smarter cities play. If we can get them talking to each other and cross sharing yeah. this innovation. I know that help. Bloomberg has done a great deal on city innovation officers right. and getting them together and it is amazing what's happening in cities. We're going to start a, a, a weekly conference call, you know, video conference call and just have, you know, the Chattanooga and uh, Cedar there's Falls a, people there's present a big, here. There's a big initiative in understanding how cities really work through basically monitoring activities and especially the delivery of services. Right. And because cities are so connected now, you can actually do things like how to use the police in a more effective way, various sort of, you know, those sorts of issues that are fundamental to the way cities work. And cities are less dysfunctional politically than Washington, D.C. tends to be. Yes. All right, I'm turning it to Megan as okay. part of our complex moderating structure. Megan and then Eric. Well, what I wanted to talk a little bit about is around uh, how talent is everywhere in diversity. And you've written, you started your book with Ada Lovelace, and uh, you end with Ada Forever. And um, you know, you and I have been looking at lost histories. So I don't know if you might want to talk a little bit about storytelling and how you discover some of the stories and what you think about that. Well, storytelling, I'll start by telling you a story, which is my daughter, eight or nine years ago, was in high school and applying to college. And being the type of parents that my wife and I are, we thought we were supposed to be involved in this process. We thought we were supposed to hover and look at her essay, and she was having none of it. She wouldn't even tell us what she was writing. One day she sent it off, and I said, okay, tell me what it's about, and she said, Ada Lovelace. And I said, yeah, I kind of know, but explain why. And she said, because I'm a computer geek. I love computers, but until I read about Ada Lovelace, I didn't realize that women could code. The only woman coder I'd ever read about was the Oracle in a Batman comic and we don't have enough role models. And so I think that's one of the issues of diversity in the tech world. So I started, I was doing this book on how the digital revolution occurred, and Ada Lovelace, as you know, is Lord Byron's daughter, but uh, she's not only poetic, she loves mathematics, and she understands how punch cards can take a numerical calculator and let it do anything, and she writes algorithms for it. And so I wanted to look at how that had progressed, and I stumbled across something, and I think it may have been when you and I first met many years ago via email, which is the six women programmers who did ENIAC, who have somewhat been lost to history, or at least they've not been celebrated They're enough. the first, uh, the ENIAC programmers are the first digital programmers in America. First digital programmers, it was in the 1940s during the war when they're building ENIAC at Penn, 
And uh, women uh, were in the forefront of mathematics back then. In fact, more women got PhDs in math in the 1930s than a generation later, in absolute number and in proportion. So if you needed great mathematical you know, minds to program a computer, you hired women. This is like Jean Jennings comes out of Missouri, a tiny town, and she'd gone to a community college, but she had mastered mathematics, and she becomes a lead programmer of this first, it's really the first real computer, the first that does general purpose, all digital interactive computer. And uh, they become the programmers of it. And Grace Hopper was doing the same for the Mark I at Harvard. And so it surprised me the role of women in early computing. But here's something else that shocked me. When I was studying the period of the 1970s when all this is coming to fruition, and you start having computer science departments at universities. By 1980, I think it is, 34% of people majoring in computer science in major American universities were women. Five years ago, it was 17%. It went the wrong way. And it's gone down to 13% this year. Right. It's a, it's it's a terrible, terrible trend. You know, one of the things is not only the, the bias, unconscious bias that we have, 70%, I think it's 70% of high school uh, computer science teachers think the boys are better than girls, despite evidence. Um, so it's just this bias that plays out. We, we talked about imagery. Gina Davis's institute counted um, imagery on children's television. And in the t TV that our kids are watching, um, for every four characters, only one is a girl. And for every five characters in STEM, only one's a girl. And in computer science, for every 15 characters, only one is a girl. So you're just watching TV as a child, and you just see, oh, the boys do this, and the girls don't do this. And you see the industry, and it just snowballs. So we have to get ourselves out of this mess. Um, but it, your work is really incredibly well, helpful because it gets uh, the lost stories told because it's, it's debilitating to not know that technical women and minorities have been part of the industry from the beginning and at elite levels like Grace Hopper inventing computer languages. Yeah, I mean, Grace Hopper also creates a collaborative open source way of doing it because all the women she knows, whether they be at ENIAC or at Harvard, they're making COBOL right. together, for example. And uh, you know we need to, I think, make this revolution more inclusive. Because one of the things about the revolution that we're in, basically, just the way the Industrial Revolution happened because you put the steam engine in connection with the mechanical processes. This happened because you put the personal computer in connection with the internet. And so you had collaboration. You had the ability to make this inclusive. But somehow the revolution has not been as inclusive as it should have been. Well, the, the other bizarre thing that's going on is that 58% of the people in American colleges are now women, and 42% are men. And yet we have this sort of glass ceiling problem. We have what is very clearly a set of unconscious biases. And if you go back to the jobs point I was making earlier, the best way to solve job growth problem is to have women have very high paying jobs, right? Because they're highly educated and clearly very capable. It's, it's a core issue for economic growth in the country, ignoring the moral and moral judgment issues, which are obvious as well. Yeah, I think in, inequality in all of its forms is the core political, economic, and moral issue of our time. And it really gets to the fact that you can't have inclusive growth. And I mean, girls who code get jobs, as you know, has been said. But also anybody who gets access to this revolution uh, one of the weird things about Ada Lovelace's father, Lord Byron, the poet, and there were many weird things about <laughs> Lord Byron, but one of them was that he was a Luddite. And I mean that literally, his only speech in the House of Lords was defending the followers of Ned Ludd, who was smashing these mechanical looms because they thought they would put people out of work. Never in history, even today, no matter what data point you look at, does technology decrease the number of jobs? It just dislocates and makes it so that you have to have different skills, mm -hmm. and yeah. that's a and, and people have studied the the loom the loom example very thoroughly. And the problem is, the people who really were losing their jobs really were unhappy because they really did learn how to lose their jobs, but their children 
flourished in a bigger There were four economy. times as many people Sorry. in the textile industry Sorry. 70 years after the introduction of the loom. Right. So um, also staying with the visibility side, I was once talking to some a group of African-American uh, engineers, uh, elite engineers in Silicon Valley, and they were mentioning just not seeing, one of them said at their company they hadn't seen a, a black engineer on stage at a company meeting um, in three years. So it's, it's this same thing around visibility. There are people here who are already in the industry who are incredible, and we need to kind of get them on stage and get them the out there and get the stories told. And then we need to pull many more people in uh, using our regular systems, but also you guys have the community college, the great community yeah. college prize that the Aspen, the Aspen Institute, Institute yeah. has, and the president's work on making community college free, which is uh, part of that initiative. How do we have more people have access to trading? And the boot camps, which many people in this room are part of innovating, well, to go back and put my historian or amateur historian hat on, when we had the dislocation of the looms, in other words, an industrial revolution, in the United States, the way we solved it 100 years ago was making high school universal and free. There were many other things we did. Nowadays, to solve our problem, one thing we have to do, as the president somewhat proposed, is make community college, trade schools, and college universal and free. When my father came back from the war, he was just some kid from Louisiana, but he learned radar. He comes back from the war, college is free, basically, either on the VA bill or to go to LSU or something. Nowadays, you don't have that. So I think that's one problem. The other is we have to make a conscious effort, I think, to make sure everybody from whatever zip code they're born into gets connected to the digital revolution. I'm from New Orleans. And after the hurricane, uh, I ended up becoming friends with 10 guys who, you know, it ended up in the Astrodome, didn't have family, whatever. And I've, you know, stayed friends with them and, you know, been part of their lives since then. And I learned so much more than they've ever learned from me, including the fact that you, they can't get a cell phone because they can't get a credit card. So they go to the AT&T store and, you know, looking how they look and without a credit card, they are left out day after day. There's like seven or eight instances a day in which it's harder for them to be part of this revolution. We need to have the will to fix it and get moving. And it's a political will, it's a moral will, and it's a will of people in this room. Mm -hmm. If you are creating something, maybe once a day you could say to yourself, how is this going to make our society a little bit better and more inclusive? Mm -hmm. Very much so. Yeah. Uh, I was just at the Lesbians Who Tech Summit and someone was on stage saying, you know, the best way to get more women and people of color into tech is get more women and people of color into tech. You know, just everybody start working on it and, and be as innovative as we are, you know, on our products around solving this problem. Uh, many creative things that could happen if you research it. So right before we're going to shift to our third part, which is where Eric's going to open up for questions, I think online there's a mic around also. Um, but next week is Sunshine Week. I don't know if people know that, but it's named for uh, President James Madison, who was our most open uh, founder. And so we're going to be celebrating with some events. Uh, the president's opened 120,000 data sets since starting in office, and uh, lots of work around uh, FOIA requests, the millions of FOIA requests done, and just trying to get stuff open. You were there in the beginning of, of this open revolution and open source. He Any knew comments? James Madison? I didn't know James <laughs> Madison. Actually. You know, it's, it's interesting that uh, in my career, what we now know as open source was, it just seemed like the right thing. It started with the Unix projects, and it just seemed obvious that if this is the group of us were busy writing on Unix and not under the control of the then corporate monopoly of AT&T, you'd get the rest of it. And of course, Unix begat Linux and so forth. And it's interesting that much of the technological revolution, the so-called LAMP stack and Ajax and so forth, ultimately traced their lineage to the notion that it's just better to write code, make it generally available, let everybody sort of deal with it and make it better. There is security through transparency. There is security by everyone seeing how these systems work. And I think we know in building this enormously complicated thing, which is the internet and all of its services, the vast majority of the services that you all use are built on open source and open systems. 
So we're bringing let, the government in Let me in ask you a question on that, if I may. Just what, what is your opinion of the blockchain and how that could transform? Uh, you're talking about the Bitcoin blockchain. Well, yeah, the Bitcoin yeah. blockchain or blo the blockchain in general, because it could be well, for more than just Bitcoin. The, the, the most interesting thing about the blockchain is that everyone always assumed that you could not build copies that couldn't be created infinitely, right? So the one way to understand the blockchain is it allows you to make a fixed number of copies of something. And that's indeed what a Bitcoin is, is essentially a ledger which has a specific number of registered in this particularly clever cryptographic way. And there's so many industries where the economics have benefited from scarcity. You know, 10, fo ten photographs of this copy or, or you know, one of five sets. And I think it's completely unexplored. Everyone's focused on the Bitcoin side of it, which is great. But think about the number of cases where it's useful to know the number of extant copies of something in the digital world. Including my own signature, let us say. Yeah. 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 It's your turn, Eric, um, or the audience's turn. Let's see. So we have a, uh, a hashtag, Ask Walter, A-S-K-W-A-L-T-E-R. But, but, oh, but, but the questions could be for Eric and Megan. So. Well, let's, let's, we'll ask all three of us. Okay. And so far, um, we, uh, so I'll just read some of the questions for you guys. We also have a microphone over there, which is difficult for me to see. So I'll, I'll ask you a couple of questions, but you see the person with the hand over there, way over there, uh, and give it a try. Um, here's an example of a question. I want my two daughters to know they can be innovators too. What can I do to encourage them and promote fixing the male bias, Walter? Well, Sorry. I'm gonna, <laughs> there's an obvious person who should help answer this, but let me say a couple things. One, I've already talked about role models are important, and yes, you can do it. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna preach for a moment, which is a lot of people who feel you know, that women should be engineers, mathematicians, should love technology, they pretend to be afraid of technology. And I hear too many people sort of say, oh, we need more arts and the humanities and our thing, and I say, yes, but we also need women who are comfortable with math and engineering. And then they will say, and sometimes it's a father, but often a mother will say, oh, but I don't like math, or I don't like engineering. And I think all of us, and this is, I'm preaching to the choir here, because y'all are on this camp, but there's so many people out there that would never admit that they don't know the difference between Macbeth and Hamlet. And they don't know the difference between, say, a Picasso and a Mondrian. But they would jokingly admit they don't know the difference between an integral equation and a differential one, or between a gene and a chromosome, or between um, you know, a transistor and a capacitor. And I think it's incumbent upon all people who want to be more inclusive, just as they would take a line of Lord Byron's poetry that Ada would love, like she walks in beauty like the night, and be able to visualize it, to try to teach all of our kids that a mathematical equation is just as beautiful, and you can visualize it as well that the way a on-off circuit works, a digital circuit works to get you to a logical answer, the way Boolean algebra works, that's beautiful. It's as beautiful so, as Hamlet and not as difficult as Hamlet. Yeah, I think this now is let's so... Ask, let's ask Megan the, no. the analogous question. Walter hit on, you know, I, this I'm is I'm asking so... you a new question. Oh. You okay. obviously agree with him. What do you believe well, is I the would most... Add, well, wait, I would add... <laughs> it's the same question of a different okay, person. Okay, come. It's his turn. What do you believe is the most significant benefit to having more women involved in tech? Megan. So now you can answer his question. Sure. <laughs> so I think um, you know diverse teams are proven. I don't know if people have seen uh, Beryl. Uh, the, there's a paper in the ACM called The Data on Diversity that Beryl Nelson wrote, and it's really a literature survey, and it's just a proven fact that better you know diverse teams make better products. And so if you want better products and broader reach and better economics, um, more impact, you would want diverse teams. Um, so that's, that's why you want women. I think to the point of getting more women and all kinds of people in, you know, it's definitely encouragement. Uh, having, there were four things, encouragement, having some role models, seeing yourself there, understanding the impact and the value, and getting to try it. Because uh, understanding what you were saying, the love of, um, 
you know, how this stuff works, it can be as fun as painting, and you just need to help so, children feel that. So, so a follow-up question for you, Megan. Do you believe educating genders separately at a young age is in, is in any way beneficial to encourage both gender, genders into STEM fields, separate or together educationally? I don't, um, I don't, ha there may be people in this room or out outside listening or others who have data on that and I don't have data on that. I haven't personally found that to be required. I do think that the impact of the imagery of our media constantly telling children, it's like Smurfettes or something, that, that the boys do this and the girls don't is really debilitating. I think that the lack of history and role models that have always been here and having, you know, our history written, written is debilitating. and. Uh, you know, Dylan uh, McGee is here from Makers. She has the largest collection of women's stories. She and I collaborate on uh, science and tech stories. You know, the fact that Katherine Johnson, for example, a now 97-year-old African-American woman, mathematician at NASA, calculated the trajectories for Alan Shepard, John Glenn, and the Apollo mission, and that we don't know that, and it wasn't in the Apollo movie I saw with Tom Hanks. Um, so. How do we get that there so that the kids, when they're in kindergarten or three years old, they just are doing their thing, hands on, so they come to love it. Nobody saying math is hard, to your point, um, so, is critical to doing it. So I, I think we, probably as long as we get the other stuff right, we have an urgent we can question. fix it. We have okay. an urgent, urgent question. You've piqued my curiosity, Walter. What's the one more odd thing about Lord Byron? Yay. <laughs> uh, I think that, well, two things. I think he was more sexually adventurous than even 99% of this room. Uh, and I don't <laughs> think I'm going to have to explain that more, but he did and, you know. Should uh, we read your book to? No, unfortunately, uh, if you read my book, you can understand Ada's love of math, not Lord Byron's love of various ways of having love. Uh, um, <laughs> Uh, the other thing uh, of Lord Byron that I found interesting to get back to the artificial intelligence, do we fear technology? He goes on vacation with Mary Shelley and the Percy Blythe Shelley, and it's uh, somewhere in Switzerland, I think, and it's, the weather is so bad, they have a contest to write stories to see who can do it. And this is where Frankenstein's monster comes, which is the original <laughs> wow. meme of fearing artificial intelligence. Oh, and uh, so that's just a I point. We have some folks here on the, on the um, who's the first? Go ahead. The, thank you very much. Eric, you had mentioned that one of the big solutions for many countries is job creation and that you believe entrepreneurs can be a major source for job creation. Well, one thing I know a lot of entrepreneurs need is capital. So can you talk a little bit about the access for diverse entrepreneurs to capital? Right. And the, the, maybe comment a little on the lack of diverse venture capitalists. Well, the first place, outside of the US, there's a, a whole bunch of problems with venture capital, mostly that it doesn't exist at all. Megan, you're actually an expert on some of the, the Africa initiatives around yeah, actually, access, and you should talk about well, that. When I, when but, I, um, what I was going to say is I think um, sure. there's so many things in the way of entrepreneurs in developing countries. So the best thing to do from their perspective is to take a position that they need connectivity, which they can get from, from, from deregulating the telecom industry and the use of smartphones. And I think a fair statement is that all interesting entrepreneurialism will now occur in developing countries by virtue of the adoption of smartphones. Yeah, I was in Uganda when Todd had emailed me about this job. Um, you know, the, just the, it's so exciting what's happening around the world, and I think one of the greatest changes we'll see in the world is the changes in Africa, you know, as the amazing talent, you know, which has been largely disconnected from the, the economic um, engine of, of the world comes, and so entrepreneurs there. But your point also takes up, um, you know, 3% of venture, I think, is going to women. Uh, venture capital, so we need to change that. We need to really adapt the, the bias that's here. The good news is we th have things like Kickstarter, Indiegogo, and other things for getting seed money, which is starting to help us, but it's really significant. It's something that um, Valerie Jarrett and I have been talking about. Uh, she leads the Council of Women and Girls that the President started, and we're gonna start doing some workshopping work 
uh, around this to get the industry talking about it. And uh, we also have just announced an inclusive entrepreneurship demo day at the White House, which will be happening later this year. And we ask everyone to submit names. Um, we want to get lots of people and really shine a light on the issue you're raising because it's, it's bad for our economy and it's bad for our world. So another question, um, Eric, which <laughs> must be for me. Um, if you have a magic wand and can change one thing, what is it? Well, there's a long list, but if I were to pick one for this audience, I would say universal access to broadband. And here's why. In all of the interesting stuff that's going to happen will be related to being a member of the knowledge economy. It's very hard to participate in the knowledge economy without broadband. It just is. Whether that's in education and bypassing the existing poor education systems with online training, uh, businesses, opportunity, entertainment, education, on and on and on, broadband, broadband is the answer. Do we have another question over here? So we've spoken. You've spoken about various things that are affecting the participation of women in the tech economy and the knowledge economy. And two things that I'd be interested in hearing your comments on would be the first, that it takes longer to be educated now than ever before. And right about the time when we're graduating from university with advanced degrees is a time often when women are taking time off to start a family for biological reasons. And the second is around venture capital, that as a white man who's reasonably young, no VC ever worries that I'm going to get pregnant. But that's not the case for my female founders. And I was wondering if you could comment on those. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, you know, I'm going to I'm going to step into my old Google days. Um, Larry, Sergey, and Eric were really great leaders around making sure that maternity and paternity leave was um, really available at, you know, in long periods of time, multiple months. Uh, and so I think it's really about having the will to make sure that we're being great for our parents, um, you know, within our companies and with our academia. And there's great examples of companies and universities and others um, who have really, in fact, uh, I was on the MIT board for many years and there's pretty much no um, building that gets built at MIT without a daycare center sort of embedded with it so that uh, young uh, academic, young parents, especially young women, can participate. One of the state-of-the-art state of issues is, uh, has to do with tenure. And the, state, and the sort of best practice now is that um, if there is a child on the way, whether it's a male or female faculty member, their timeline to tenure is increased by one year. They get one extra year, which was seen as sort of a major, major uh, impediment, if you will, to the tenure process and also having, hmm. having children. Um, corporations now, certainly in the US, typically have uh, the same standard for maternity as well as paternity leave, which in my view in the US is still uh, way short of what it should be. Hmm. Working on family leave and other things are critically important. We need to be much, uh, much more evolved in how we're thinking about this uh, if we want the diverse talent that we need at the table. Um, let's get one more question over here, and then we'll go back to, to uh, ask Walter. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so, you know, a lot of people in this room, we, we even have jobs that are around the label of innovation, uh, which I think is a very ambiguous term. And, and Eric, you at, at Google, a large company, thinking about how can you systematize innovation across such a large organization. Megan, you at the government, thinking about how can the government innovate, and, uh, and Walter, as someone who's sort of studied this from the lens of a, a lot of people who have done it so successfully, I was, I was hoping that maybe each of you could, com on, could uh, comment on what you think innovation is and how do you systematize it? Because that, a lot of us have this responsibility now of, of helping our organizations become more innovative, uh, but you know, one, defining it, and two, figuring out how do you operationalize it. Are, are, are two sort of large challenges. So I was yeah. hoping you guys could comment on that. I think any great innovator has been somewhat rebellious, thought out of the box, or was able to think different. And it really means making a creative leap, which almost by definition, machine learning can't do. It's not algorithmic of how you be innovative. But one of the things I learned in the book is we biographers tend to distort history a little bit. We think innovation happens when a guy or a gal goes into a garage or a garret 
and a light bulb moment happens and there's innovation. It actually happens in teams. It happens where people you know, bounce ideas around each other and any great innovative step came from somebody having some vision but also connecting it to an engineer or a designer or a team of people so that you could execute on it. Because vision without execution is hallucination. You got to have the innovation of creating teams before you can create products. Yeah, so, so that's something that we, in government we've been doing uh, is creating these idea labs or kind of uh, design labs within an agency. So for example, at Health and Human Services, Brian Sivak runs the idea lab there. And it's not a separate, like a research lab, it's embedded, and the idea is a place for entrepreneurs and residents, very classic from our industry, who can come for a short period of time. He has budget for them to work together. Maybe they have a Medicare, Medicaid idea, whatever they have, and then ultimately work on that for a few weeks, prototype it, have uh, you know a data palooza or, or you know an event where you're sure. showing it off and reviewing it. I've noticed how Harvard uh, Perry Hewitt is here as the chief technology. She's the chief technology officer. They've created the innovation lab, yeah. and it simply means if. And that's the other thing, teams work better in person. Yeah. Now maybe I'm old fashioned, but this notion that you can have a teleconferences as Walter, opposed you're not. There's lots and lots of evidence yeah. that people being in the same place yeah. is more productive. That's there what are, South by there, is there all are about. There are people who have studied this that various physics measures of 30% or greater productivity by having the equivalent of an office cooler and in physical presence. That's why most people are expected to show up in a physical place to work and in a pretty large building. And one of the innovations of our digital revolution was the open workspace that Bob Noyce and Gordon Moore did at Intel. Which is now sort of taken over. Um, Walter, maybe you can ask this question with a context of the history of innovation. And I get this in various forms from lots of people. With so few engineers coding the future, how can we trust they will do the right thing for all of us and not for them? First of all, we have to understand the technology ourselves. If you delegate something to the them, you're in trouble. I hate it when people tell me, oh, it was so important to learn Latin and Greek. And I say, yeah, but do you know the difference between Pascal and Python, or whatever it may be? You have to understand how your machines work. One of the things I worry about when it comes to machines, whether it's you know, the one you're handling or the one I am, is that when I grew up, uh, I used to make ham radios. I mean, I was a real geek. And in our basement, we had, you know, transistors and capacitors and resistors that all needed to be sorted. And you'd solder it on a circuit board, and you understood how a circuit board worked. And you understood how coding worked. Therefore, you were not as afraid of it. It wasn't like you had to trust other people to do it. I worry a little bit that with you know, machines that don't open and my iPhone, you can't even change, you know, your, your phones, you can't even open it up. We don't have that comfort level with a hands-on feeling of how does a logical circuit work? What is a logic gate? What does a transistor do? Or you know, what, when you etch them on a microchip, how does it all work to form something? I have loved some of the things I've seen at South By which are educational programs where even though you can't do what I did, which is solder a lot of uh, resistors, capacitors together and feel comfortable with the circuit board, at least you have these learning games where you understand why an on-off switch or a logic gate will get you somewhere in an algorithm. So I, I think the fear of other people will control because there's so few engineers comes, uh, you would never go to a hospital without knowing a little bit about the disease you were worried about. You should know about your machines, you should know how circuits work, you should go online at edX or Coursera and take the circuits and course. And by the way, there, there are universities that are now proposing universal education at the collegiate level of how do computers work, basic programming, beta data. Basic but it's data not just for college people, it's for everybody in the society. Right. You should know. So there's, there's a critical, um, it's critical, great stuff happening in the UK in two forms. One is with the Raspberry Pi, uh, which is like their BBC Micro, right? Yeah. Um, now, yeah, you, most you, children. You should take a minute there and describe. The Raspberry sure. Pi is a brilliant invention. It's a roughly $40 self contained board. It's that the, like be, the board from your phone. Um, and it uh, can be used with the television, and it's widely, widely used now in schools uh, to give basic programming 
classes. Yeah, Go there's ahead. Arduino, there's Galileo Intel from Intel. But uh, basically, all the kids in the elementary school level in the UK, they're working to make sure every kid gets a hold of a Raspberry Pi um, and that they're able to learn to program it. And they, their point of view is by second or third grade, you've learned to read and you learn things like instructions for cooking class. And so why shouldn't you learn instructions for code? And the UK has been uh, spearheading, like I talked about our United States Digital Service. They started the UK Digital Service about two years before us. Had, I we tell them it's their new Beatles. Um, they're exporting it. And so the government digital service in the UK has now formed something with other governments called the D5, which is like a G8, you know, the D digital government. So it's UK, Estonia, Israel, South Korea, and New Zealand. Um, we are observing, we, we will work to join that. But the reason we bring it up is in addition to kind of digital government, open source, analytics, all the best practice that they're doing there, which is part of their playbook, uh, one of the requirements to be part of the D5 is all children, you need to be on track to teaching coding to all children in your country. And so uh, it's something that's coming to all five of those countries. We need so, it to come to ours. Another question, uh, slightly on a different topic. What can the government do to repair the damage caused by surveillance leaks to ensure the U.S. remains a leader in the Internet innovation? I'm not sure, Megan, if you're able to answer that question. If not, I'll answer on your behalf. Why don't you start off with it? Um, the industry has been very, very upset about the, uh, what we consider inappropriate and perhaps illegal NSA spying on domestic citizens. And many of us have worked hard to get the government to stop. Um, indeed, the Section 215 authorization is ending or is in the process, or is about to end. And uh, the industry as a whole has moved to full detailed encryption of transportation of data from mobile device to server as well as at rest. And the way we like to say this is that we've encrypted the data so that you cannot go in through the back door, you have to come in through the front door, which is with a proper um, FISA court order. I think, uh, and I think the, the president, you know, as, as the news came out, uh, has, has sort of, the report came out in, in January um, last year and there's been an update. It. I'm not a super expert in this area and I'm coming up to speed to it, on it being new in government. But uh, it's interesting in innovation where um, we're in a learning space. And I think it's so important that we have open dialogue like we have. I think we're in the middle of that right now, for, for example, on encryption for cell phones. Um, the industry is doing best practice. The president is supportive of encryption in cell phones. Um, and yet, you know, the, the policing and other groups are very worried about the protection of the American people. And so it's a conversation. We went to Stanford. Um, to open the cyber summit and continue the conversation. It's, it's an open dialogue and we as an industry have to keep innovating and bring our TQ to government so we can have very informed conversations about what the best practice can be and what the options are. Next question over here. Hi. Walter, uh, you mentioned a little while ago um, the absurdity of someone admitting that they don't know the difference between a gene and a chromosome. Hmm. So I'm just going to preface this question with biology was not my subject in college. Um, so my, my question is, me um, and I think a lot of people in this room are people who work with tech but don't have actual programming experience. What do you recommend for, for people like us um, in terms of should we focus on picking up programming experience or focusing on ways to work better with the tech that's out there right now? I think that I'm going to turn this to Eric, too, who probably deals with this quite a bit at Google. I think the next great wave of the digital revolution will be not just the engineering-driven wave that we've had for the past 50 years, but connecting technology to two big things. One is creativity. That's what South By is all about. And the other is with the life sciences. So I think it's important to understand, you know, how can I be creative? How can I do an interactive role-playing game or LARP that would be a great piece of literature and connected to technology? Or how can I have a targeted therapy based on the gene sequencing and mine the big data to do it? It's important to know more than just the engineering. But if you're a great biologist and you're Eric Lander, who I refer to as the second smartest Eric I know, um, and you're doing the gene sequencing at Harvard MIT, the fact is he has to connect that to the big data algorithms that are being developed. And so, 
you know, you really need to be familiar with all fields. Also, learning how to code, you don't have to, you'll never be, if you're me, a great coder. But if you do it for a while, at least you understand the process of how an algorithm works and what can and can't be done easily. I think the biggest trend is going to be the use of machine intelligence across large data sets to solve every problem. I can't think of a field, a field of study, a field of research, whether it's English, the soft sciences, the hard sciences, or any corporation that can't become far more efficient, far more novel, far more clever by virtue of that kind of data. And it's all happening because of cloud computing. Mm -hmm. Next question. So um, speaking of innovation, entrepreneurship happens both inside and increasingly outside of college. Uh, how is government adapting to this phenomenon, and what are your views on the subject? How's government adapting to entrepreneurship in inside and outside of college? In college. Um, I think one of the things is that universities themselves are adapting to this. Um, so we're seeing great trends where, uh, like Case Western and others, are having these kind of startup centers or fab labs or maker spaces or gathering points for the entrepreneurial communities. Many of the universities for much of history you know, have been part of spin outs, um, and, but that hasn't happened with as much of the kind of startup centers that we see in, in our tech hubs. So we're starting to see those on campuses. Um, I know that uh, you know, Spelman and Howard and a bunch of others are, are putting those into place as well. So that's doing really well. I also, uh, back to the UK, at, in their education system, they realized, to Eric's point earlier about entrepreneurship, that young people were not having exposure to the idea of becoming an entrepreneur as a, as a career track. And so they started a very simple program called Founders for Schools. And they just make sure that three entrepreneur types show up at your school for an assembly Q&A program for, for an hour. And they're trying to roll that out across the UK. And we're trying to bring that kind of stuff to this and, country. And the White House and you and us at the Aspen Institute are doing a lot to reinvent the concept of what a community college is, which so. I think is going to be disruptive and at the vanguard of solving some of our problems. You know, as the lectures move to video and then you have great performance lectures, but really you can do much more interactive, personalized learning with video, those spaces can open up into these great maker spaces. So we're very hopeful about uh, the community colleges being a nexus uh, for entrepreneurship and making and moving, moving code boot camps onto campus, et cetera. Uh, so they can be a, a great source of innovation for the community on, on any topics. I'll give you an example. We're going to be hosting an event later uh, in about a month where universities are working with their cities on city problems. So CMU is doing amazing work uh, in, in the city of Pittsburgh. Howard is doing work with water. Uh, I mentioned the South Bend mayor uh, working with Notre Dame. So where people are kind of using their college as a lab place for the city itself, the city as an ecosystem lab is really exciting. So there's great opportunities to pull students into real problems that would be incredibly engaging to them um, and entrepreneur on behalf of issues and challenges that we have. We have a question for Megan. You talk about the importance of TQ. How important is EQ in innovation? <laughs> I, think, I think all of them are important, but you know, people do things and they come as they are. And so you know, some people have high EQ and not so great EQ or they're learning. Um, some people have great IQ. Uh, and TQ, the reason why I use TQ is I want people to really think about people who have tech skills um, to be at the table when you're doing policy work. But I, EQ is critical, although if somebody, you know, diversity is critical too. So if somebody has challenges with getting along, you have to figure out, you know, how to do great team building work with them and help them see what they might not be seeing to help them get along. We have another question over here. So, uh, Megan, my question is actually about unconscious bias. And I know that you mentioned uh, today several times about unconscious bias. And I've heard you say that if you're not mitigating unconscious bias, you're not unlocking the innovation potential that you could be. And I'm wondering if you've continued that discourse on unconscious bias uh, in your work in the government. And then I have a second question for your male panelists, which is we know that unconscious bias research tells us that women are interrupted a lot more than men. And I wonder if you're aware that you have interrupted Megan many more times than you've interrupted <laughs> each other. Okay. I think uh, it's a, 
it's an interesting thing, unconscious bias. It's, it's something that we all have. I have it, we all have it, and it's just something we have to really debug. Um, an example would be, uh, if you, as you learn these things, I really encourage you to go research this, because understanding it will really wake you up. Um, if there's uh, 10 char characteristics for a job, um, on average, a woman will apply if she has seven, and a man will apply if he has three, and there's nothing wrong with either of the people. It's just how we're either socialized or wired. Who knows where it's coming from? But it matters if you're a manager because you're looking at a group of people and some of them have their hand up and some of them don't. And you need to see through that coming at you and say, OK, let me debug this and figure out who the best person for this job is. Um, so, so there's many, many data points like that that we could come up to speed on and then design systems to try to get past that. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges women face, not the interrupting thing, but really, you know, I often have an experience where I say an idea, and I can be cryptic, but uh, I say an idea, and then, you know, a couple minutes or 30 minutes later, a guy says the same idea, and, and, if it's, and it's a fabulous idea. Women have that experience all the time. Um, and so we just have to get better at that. It's not anybody's fault. We've inherited some things, but once we see it, um, we were talking a little bit about the um, Jefferson quote. Um, and about how we evolve. There's a wonderful quote in the Jefferson Memorial. He's speaking about government, um, but it could apply to all of the things we're talking about, diversity, civil rights. It's, it, I'm gonna paraphrase it poorly, but it's, he says, I'm not a big fan of the rapid change of law, but as the human mind evolves, um, just like we shouldn't take on, uh, you know, we, we need to move past where we were, where our barbaric ancestors were, much like you can't fit the coat you wore as a boy. Mm -hmm. Right, so, so we are in the middle of an evolution. I actually think, my friend Steve Perlman always says, if you've been a thousand years from now and you look back at this time, we imagine this is about technology and genomics and all this stuff, but he thinks that it's this 200 years when the most extraordinary thing happened, the last 100 and the one we're in, when all of a sudden, much more, all of humanity finally got to come to the table. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's an amazing thing to think about. Um, you know, and in terms of women, I, I've been trying to find the Declaration of Sentiments. Does anybody in this room know what that is? Yeah, so it's interesting. Women's rights are so unknown, the history, that even our fundamental founding document, like the Emancipation Proclamation for Women from 1848, Seneca Falls, written by Elizabeth Cady Stanton, is missing from the National Archives. So I'm trying to find it. I was thinking about Nicolas Cage. Um, one thing I'd love to do with all of you is uh, to redline it. There's the sentiments they wrote about what they were doing. I'd love to redline it for today. One of them is about equal pay. Um, and one of them is, the last one actually ends with breaking women's confidence. So I encourage you all to read the declaration. It's an amazing document. It was signed um, two thirds by uh, women and one third by fabulous men uh, like, uh, like Frederick Douglass. And so oh. I encourage us to find it and, and sort of, just in general, this is a serious issue. We're leaving a lot of people away from the table, uh, women, minorities, and also just diversity, you know, white and Asian men who maybe want to think differently too. It, it would be better for all of us to get our act together on this as soon as we can. And I, I believe in this industry to be the fastest moving uh, in terms of our ability. I could think of a... No better note upon which to end. I want to thank Eric. I want to thank Megan. Thank you all. I'll be upstairs on the fourth floor signing books if you have more questions. And they'll be hanging out if you have more questions. Thank you for being government. here. Okay, thank you all. And, and that one thing that keeps coming to me is uh, this very simple phrase. Um, and I'm going to take a note from Tony Robbins' motivational speaker here for a second. And we're going to have something that we're going to really focus in on, and, and that is these simple words, the cavalry isn't coming. I'm looking around like Tony. I'm going to let it sit. <laughs>